Hi, everybody, and welcome to a new edition of Newsmakers. I'm Jerry Roberts. It is Friday, September 6th. We have our all-star panel of top local journalists with us, Kelly Fozzi from the Santa Barbara Independent, Josh Molina, man of many hats and host of the global breakthrough podcast, Santa Barbara Talks. And we welcome back our friend Dale Francisco, conservative columnist. Uh, thanks all for coming. Hey, it's really hot out. I don't know if anybody noticed, so it's a good day to start with climate change. Uh, Callie, I note in the Santa Barbara Independent website that we have a, a hot heat wave, quote unquote here. Uh, but uh, uh, apropos of that, the county uh, supervisors recently passed the uh, the new climate uh, change uh, plan. Uh, can you recap kind of real quick what's in it? And then uh, we can uh, we can uh, talk a little bit about uh, what some of the things that uh, they need to uh, make it happen. Mm. Uh, yeah, so the climate action plan kind of just contains some, um, I guess, some broad goals to reduce the county's uh, greenhouse gas emissions by, I think it was, I think it was 30 to 50 percent below 2018 levels. I forget the exact number. Um, and yeah, so they want to, they want to do that by like, you know, switching gas powered appliances to electric, um, and, you know, installing more EV chargers, I guess, um, switching to clean energy, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, it is an audacious goal. I think that was the word that Laura caps you 50% yes below 2018 in the next six years, we're going to get there. Yeah, um, that's, that's very audacious. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that struck me in your piece, which is a really good piece, everybody uh, is very um, informative, was Supervisor Steve Lavanino noting that they had done this exercise in 2015 and it had failed. And he said that uh, we lead the league in rhetoric, but not results and, and said it act, things actually got worse. Um, the other, the other question I had was what have, what did they do about oil and gas production? Cause it seemed like they were saying, well, uh, we don't really need to account for that. Yeah. So I think the County approached it with, yeah, exactly. That kind of flippant attitude of, you know, we already adopted this thousand metric ton of CO2 threshold for greenhouse gas emissions for, you know, stationary sources like oil and gas. So we don't need to include that. Oh, and they're, you know, they're already regulated by all of these like state and local edu agencies. Like why, why would we need to include them? Um, but that, so they weren't included in the original CAP, but that got a lot of pushbacks from environmental groups, of course. Um, and so they kind of like, it's almost like a, like a sticky note afterthought of <laughs> um, we will, you know, review way they're directing county staff to review ways that oil and gas can reduce their emissions or like the county can direct oil and gas operators to reduce their emissions and then the staff will come back to the board in about six months with those recommendations for you know their consideration um but it feels more of a like you know like a, a just a way to alleviate the the environmental groups for now um but yeah, I don't know. It feels feels more like rhetoric, like uh, yeah. You know, and it comes, that. you know, as this this business that the board did with, or that the county is doing with Sable Offshore Oil, the new company that's dealing with the uh, on what used to be called Exxon or somebody. Um, now they're gonna get, they're gonna be able to restart apparently operations because they're gonna put the shutout valves underground or something i i didn't quite understand the whole thing but there are definitely it appears they're going to be offshore oil operations yep um yeah i think that you know you know sables you know presence hung pretty heavily over the meeting they were never mentioned by name but you know that idea that they are going to be restarting these offshore platforms and restarting this um pipeline that caused the devastating 2015 refugio oil spill is just yeah i think it was definitely on the back of a lot of people's minds 
Yeah, and then they had the cost in there of three hundred thirty-seven million, but it was kind of unclear what that's all going for, charging stations or something. Yeah, I feel like it. That's probably mostly going to be charging stations. I know those aren't cheap, and I think that they have big plans for you know putting them into like multifamily residences and and kind of making it so that EVs are more accessible to like lower income um like populations and um you know multifamily communities. Yeah. Hey, Dale, you were, uh, correct me if my, my recollection of history is wrong, but I, I believe you were on council when the city first adopted it, the, the city of Santa Barbara first adopted a, a climate plan or began to do, to, to talk about doing that. Uh, uh, but have you uh, kept up with that? What's the latest from the city on the, on the uh, climate front? Well, I, I've, I've kept up with it a little. I mean, to me, this whole idea of climate action plans, especially from a place like the city of Santa Barbara, I mean, what is our contribution to the CO2 emissions? We don't have any coal power plants to close. Uh, there's, a, there's a real lack of quantitative thinking among our local politicians. And the things that we've, quote unquote, done to solve the climate problem, like uh, banning new gas stoves, I mean, it's not gonna make, a, it's not gonna make any difference anywhere in the world. So. I look at all of these things as mainly political exercises. That's what it's about. Um, but I did note in uh, in Josh's article, Josh, you had a great quote uh, uh, from Megan Harmon about what outstanding leadership the city of Santa Barbara has provided for uh, sea level rise adaptation. Well, look is, at look behind Josh. That used to be his backyard. That's right. That's true. Okay, so it's a good thing that we're working on this. <laughs> well, one of the one of the things that I can't remember where I noted it. I noted it somewhere. You know, NOAA keeps track of the sea level rise in Santa Barbara, and it hasn't changed. The rate of of sea level rise has not changed. It's like 0.19 millimeters per year. It hasn't changed since they started measuring it in 1973, and in fact, in the in the last few years since they adopted the sea level rise adaptation plan, it's gone down to 0.15 million. Well, the plan is working then. <laughs> that must be it. <laughs> we, ha we have an incredible city council. We really do. Yeah, Josh, you want, to, you want to weigh in on, on uh, the climate? Well, you know, environmental reporting has never been really my thing or interest, quite frankly. But I will say my background with Kalita Beach, uh, you know, I like the park. I like the green. You know, I've had plenty of uh, picnics, barbecues, birthday parties. And um, I do think that we need to do more to restore and save the park, the green space, and not just let the the sand and the water take over everything because it's an outdoor space for a lot of families, myself included. And if you're there, it looks like it's shrinking rapidly. Um, I would just say to Dale, I'm not disagreeing with him, but the perspective I hear from other people is, you know, it's like the, the um, it might be symbolic, the work, but everybody has to do their part. And so even if it doesn't make a big difference in the grand scheme of climate change, um, it's good to sort of do these things because these people who live here go out in the world and they have the potential to make other impacts. You know, it's like the, what is it, the the starfish you throw the sea star you throw back into the ocean you know it makes a difference for that one not for all of them but i don't know it feels like i mean they have to be doing something i mean that's it's more good than bad or are you saying it hurts jobs by well here, well here's my here's my other question about it and callie noted this in her piece that they they also want to ease the environmental review process of future development projects. So so at the same time we're building all this housing, eight hundred thousand units or however many it is, um, we're going to ease the environmental review and that's going to help us on the climate. Uh, I I don't know I don't know that seemed a little contradictory. Why don't we just let our friend Elliot Jacobson? We'll install him on the board of supervisors and he'll fix all of this. Which I guess Elliot the greatest Elliot. answer to all of this is do. It's stop just stop it. It creating Although, new things all right shout out to her to to laura caps because she did make a good point i thought in your piece kelly where she said you know we can start with what we can do which is the school districts and cottage hospital and you know institutions that 
have some control over this. All right. All right. We'll leave it there. The hot heat continues. Meanwhile, <laughs> uh, and uh, let's uh, let's uh, talk a little politics, uh, starting with the uh, tax increase that's going to be on the ballot in the city. Uh, I guess we've decided to call it Measure I. This is the one half cent sales tax increase. Dale, you've looked at this. Now, this is for what? General fund spending, correct? This is not for infrastructure or anything else. We already did that. Yeah. No, that, I mean, they've got a, they've got a, a calculated, I think it's seven and a half million dollar budget shortfall. And so what do you do when you have a budget shortfall? Well, of course you raise the taxes. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I look at this council, I mean, this is a council that really has not fundamentally changed its philosophy since Kathy Maria was mayor. And I think Randy's had a good influence, but they're still making the same kinds of decisions they were making before. And if, if city revenues are down, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe it has something to do with closing our uh, main street in the center of town. And it could, it could, it's possible. Well, the TOT tax is down month after month after yeah. month. And now the sales tax is down too. And that ought to put a light bulb up that. I, well, exactly, Jerry. And I think when when you see all of your city revenues declining simultaneously, you ought to think about how you're managing it rather than thinking about how we can get more money from this from the citizens. This is not a new issue. I mean, you were you were the budget expert on the council when you were on. And I mean, there were there, there were year-to-year -year deficits. I mean, was there a structural deficit, a so-called structural deficit? No, no, I wouldn't say that there was a structural deficit. There was a deficit that happened when we had the recession starting in 2009. Um, Which makes you know, sense. I mean, yeah. conditions, right. Yeah, all of, the, all of the things, sales tax, TOT, everything is going down. But that wasn't because of something the city had changed. That was because the economy in general was tanking. So... So what did we do? Well, we didn't raise taxes. We got rid of employees. That's the major expense that the city has. And we did it in such a way that it was all by attrition. We weren't, you know, we weren't going out firing people. It's just so when people left, they weren't getting rehired. And, mm -hmm. and that was hard. Yeah. But that was, to me, that was the responsible way to deal with that problem. Not to go out and tell, because the taxpayers are hurting too. It's not just the city. Right. Josh, did you ha have you heard anything in the debate about this? Well, it wasn't much of a debate, but in the discussion of this on council that would indicate any there's anybody who's looking at it with that perspective to look at the expense side rather than the revenue side all the time. Yeah, well, you know, Megan Harmon, um, she's opposed to this sales tax. She voted to put it on the ballot. Council member Alejandro Gutierrez is also opposed to it, although she voted to put it on the ballot. Uh, I think that Megan Harmon's perspective is we put so much aside in reserves and it just sits there that we should maybe figure out a way to use that money when we need it, which is when we have these deficits rather than leaving it there. And I don't think she's talking about the emergency reserves, but she's talking about just the general fund contingency reserves. And I think that you know, when you cover this stuff for a long time, you see these patterns, but you have a new city administrator who I know you're a big fan of, Jerry. I am. Relatively new. Uh, He's new going to be on the show on September 20th. Mark your calendar. Save the date. Okay. Yes. Uh, a new finance director. And I think that, you know, in the world of urban planning and governance and um, city management, public administration, it's like go to to like, well, let's increase the sales tax by a half cent. Oh, look. Oxnard is more than us, you know, and look at these other cities, they're more than us. But it's just uh, what I don't really like about what they're doing is the presentation of it. They're like, we need to keep public safety uh, in Santa Barbara and passing this sales tax will allow us to do that. And it's just such nonsense. Like if we don't pass the sales tax, we're still going to have uh, first responders and public uh, um, service, public safety. We still are, but they kind of like try to hit that home as though we're going to be in trouble there. And uh, there should be other things that they're looking at in addition to, um, you know, this regressive tax. And 
I don't see anybody coming out strong against it. I see those running for office as being just parrots for the city administration, which is always a problem. Like we don't elect elected officials to be parrots of management. We elect them to be overseers of the board, you know, of, of the management. So I don't know if there'll be any organized opposition, but with all the stuff on the ballot, and if you live, you're going to be voting on a hotel bed tax in the county, a sales tax. Yeah. I, I don't know. They better pull out all the stops to get this thing passed. Well, you're right. Uh, just the Measure H, which you just referenced, uh, would increase the transit occupancy tax, which everybody always loves to do because that's not us. That's somebody else um, in, the, in the unincorporated county. Uh, it only affects, I think, 24 facilities, but one of them is the Miramar. So, uh, you know, what's that, a thousand bucks a night or something? So that that could be, there's a couple of million bucks they're looking for there. Um, and then measure P, which is actually, how do we describe this? An extension of a bond issue uh, for City College. And Dale, you have spent the last three weeks deeply immersed in uh, the thousand page <laughs> report uh, discussing measure P. What'd you come up with? Well, I think I need another, at least another three weeks. Uh, <laughs> but I can tell you, I read, um, they have a, a budget sustainability work group that's been at work for two and a half years on this. And they they came out with a report in April, which I did read, and I don't claim to understand all of it. But some of the amazing things that I found there, and, and Josh, I'm sure you can speak to this as an instructor, uh, the most startling thing to me was their enrollment peaked in 2010 at 18,761. In 2023, enrollment was 11,656. That's a 37% drop, which is incredible. And then the, uh, and, and that 11,000, that includes people who are uh, attending class remotely for Zoom classes, right? So who knows how many people Josh, you can probably tell us how many is, is is City College a ghost town? You had didn't you have to give up a class or something, Chief? I mean, City College is not as busy as it was ten years ago, five years ago. Um, there's fewer people on campus. Enrollment has dropped, and I kind of blame a lot of that hysteria we had a few years ago, where people were saying international students were coming in and uh, taking over local housing, which was just not true. But the college then kind of like responded to it from a PR perspective and took in less or recruited less. And now we're trying to get them back. Um, but you know, Josh, don't, don't you think the major cause was COVID? Yeah, we, we, we haven't bounced back since COVID and um, it is, it is not what it was in terms of the number of people on campus for sure. Um, and it's affecting a lot of classes, you know, so it's that that is true. So is the point you're making, Dale, is we have enrollment. So why do we need to pass the bond? Is that yeah, it's not it's not necessarily that. And there might be a reason to pass the bond. That's well, I was shocked that Dale's not actually a, a formally I've still got three more weeks. <laughs> He's still thinking about it. Which is but I think um his credit. You know, part of part of what they're saying in this report is if enrollment goes down by 37%. And then our income from the state goes down accordingly because they get, they get. I can't remember what the name for it is, but it's some uh, funding that they get from the state based on the number of full-time students that they have. Okay, so so that funding is dropping by a a, a a similar amount. It hasn't yet because the state passed some things to relieve uh, the burden of COVID absenteeism, but that expires after this year. That's over with. Right. So they're going to hit. They're going to get hit by the full impact of this starting next year. Right. So I understand. You know, they've got less money to work with, and if they can, if they can move all of the maintenance and construction funds out of the general fund and into this Measure P stuff, I I understand the advantage to them. Yeah. Um, there there are hope. buildings on campus who are badly in need of um, sure. upgrade and retro. I understand your classroom has been particularly hard hit, Josh. I have a great classroom. You um, need, I'm you need the, the coffee bar in there or something. Yeah, but I, <laughs> I didn't. Well, We're anyways. in the multimedia. No, the campus center, you know, is uh, definitely a building that is in need of restoration and seismic retrofitting and that sort of thing. So 
Um, I mean, it is a big bond measure, but I think in the context of all the stuff that is on the ballot that it's know, gonna I wouldn't guarantee anything is going to pass. Yeah. Yeah. It's a $198 million bond extension of measure V, which was a bond passed in 2008. And you'll all remember measure S, which was uh, defeated in 2014. So, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. Marsha Croninger, who who is, I think, triple smart on that board, voted against this thing. So I think everybody should take a hard look at it. Um, uh, apologies to Jonathan, our friend Jonathan Abood, who is leading the charge on it. Uh, and then I just want to mention one more thing, which is on the statewide ballot. And we'll have a special show on all the statewide initiatives. But Prop 5 would reduce the threshold vote from two thirds to 55% uh, that's needed for bonds uh, to do with housing and infrastructure projects. So we'll keep an eye on that one too. All right, uh, Josh, you were at the uh, Labor Day picnic. You're doing the Lord's work out there. Uh, God knows uh, on, on your holiday. Um, the Democrats uh, were celebrating their candidates, and there's a lot of them. I mean, we've talked. We talked last week about the two uh, city council races in, in in Santa Barbara, which are which are hot. But there's a there's a lot that's on the ballot. There's Goleta council and mayor. There's um, a unified school district, which I know Callie, you're deeply invested in, and um, the, the the county board of education has a couple of seats. City College uh, has a good race. And uh, of course, uh, Representative Salute Carbajal is too chicken to debate Tom Cole. The, jeez, uh, really, Salute? Come on. Anyway, uh, but I digress. Uh, John, He's not going to come on your show now, Jerry. You <laughs> he loves to come on my show. No, so so what was the what was the mood of the Democrats? What What were the... Who was being highlighted? Uh, First of all, Labor Day is not a holiday for, for me at New Sock. We get two holidays a year, and we have to pick them. So I usually save it for uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving. But that's me grumbling beside the point. So Monday was a regular day for me. Um, but yeah, you Labor Day. You get your birthday, right? No, Jerry, I don't get my birthday. You get oh. two, two days a year. Okay, so anyway, the... The Labor Day barbecue is always really incredible because you have this gathering and collection of Democratic elected officials, activists, uh, party activists, and they're all in one place. And it's a presidential year, so there's a lot of energy, a lot of buzz. There's almost 300 people there, and we heard all the candidates sort of talk about, um, you know, they had a minute to talk about why, the, why they're running. And so it was pretty cool. Uh, Laura Capps and Doss Williams stood up there shoulder to shoulder and talked about Josh, go over a minute. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> he went first and he went longer than a minute. And so <laughs> they talked about the transit occupancy tax increase and stumped for that. So that was kind of interesting. And then uh, candidates for uh, Santa Barbara City Council, at least Democratic ones, spoke Galita, Santa Maria, Buellton. It was a uh, a big event and a big deal. And you get a sort of sense of where they're headed in their, their campaign. They're obviously energized by Kamala Harris and uh, her presidential campaign. So that's infusing a lot of energy in this, in this campaign. Did, uh, did, were the uh, uh, unified school district, were the, were the school board candidates there? Yeah. Uh, Celeste Caffrey, Bill Banning were there. Uh, they are the Democratic Party. These are only Democratic Party endorsed candidates. Uh, they were there. They spoke for a minute. Um, Wendy Sims Moten, the chair of the board, she's not running. Uh, she's typically been endorsed by the Democratic Party. So uh, there's some seats in play uh, there. Not there, by the way, with no big surprise was Mike Jordan, who as we talked about at length, was not endorsed by the party. And he was there last year. He's there every year. So he wasn't there. So um, that was interesting. How about Sunita Beal? Be, uh, oh, yeah. Sunita Beal is running for a re-election, and she was there, too. Um, and she gave a talk as well. So, Kelly, it looks like we got two appointed incumbents and one open seat. Uh, this is really the first time... Well, it's the second election when district elections happen, but I think this is the first time when this is going to, we'll have an entirely uh, district elected board. 
And I know you're going to be interviewing all those people. Uh, is the independent going to be doing any kind of public forums? Yeah, so we'll be holding a forum on October 2nd um, from 5.30 to 7.30 at the Parish Hall. Um, yeah, and we'll be, you know, we'll be interviewing all the candidates. Um, should be cool. Okay. All right. And uh, I I trust you're going to ask them all about literacy and what the uh, all right thinking people agree is the correct way to teach reading, um, which... <laughs> People may have read about. All right, Josh, uh, real quick, that there's a um a city count or a, excuse me, a, a city college uh race, Jet Black uh Mart who who was gonna run for council and kind of got pushed aside by the party. Uh and is that a competitive race? Has she got uh, a, a tough competition there? Yeah, so Jet Black Merits was gonna run for city council district one decided to run for school board, uh, sorry, board of trustees instead. Is it competitive? I mean, it's an open seat, so we don't really know. Jet Black is endorsed by the party and she's gonna get a lot of support, a lot of uh, walkers, phone banking. And so I would say she's definitely the front runner. She's running against Sebastian Aldana, who is on the city's Parks and Recreation Commission. He's an East Side neighborhood activist. He knows the east side really well. He's somebody who's been talked about over the years about potentially running for city council. He, um, I don't know his party registration. He's more of a moderate type conservative, sort of older kind of, um, you know, uh, just a different sort of uh, perspective on local issues, a little bit of that anti-government perspective. So um, I would say Jet Black is probably going to win because she's just going to have more support and more resources. And Sebastian's not going to have that party. So, I mean, I guess if Sebastian were to sync up with Alejandro Gutierrez's campaign and they work together, um, he he knows a lot of people and he's worked in the district. Was he not one of the original plaintiffs on the district election suit? Or am I misremembering that? I, I um, don't, you know, he yeah, might have been. He might have been one of the supporters. He's definitely somebody who, if you're on the east side and you mention his name, they know who he is because he's bilingual and he can talk in all circles and he's put in the work. Um, I just don't know if he's going to be able to get enough support to win that broader Santa Barbara City College district. Uh, of course, Veronica Gallardo, that was her seat. She was the longtime um, chair of the Board of Trustees. She's not running, so there are some unknowns. But, you know, Jet Black is a really good candidate. She would have been a good candidate for District 1. I don't know how many times I've said that in case it's not clear. I wish she wouldn't have dropped out of it, but she did because uh, she felt like, uh, you know, this contest would be a little bit better. So I'd say betting money's on Jet Black to win that seat. All right. And then we got Golita Mayor and Council. We'll talk about that next time. All right. Real quick. Uh, we're running out of time. Uh, uh, Callie. Uh, Casey Kilgore, the uh, much celebrated principal of Franklin School, uh, uh, lost a bet, I guess, to her students. What Talk about what, what that was all about. Um, yeah, so she, she bet her students that if they could raise their state test scores by, I think it was like 50%, that she would uh, sleep on the roof. And they did. So she did. She got up there with a tent and a camping chair and um, camped out. And they had like a little celebration with um, live music. And and Mark Alvarado, the new um, director Boys of the Club. Boys and Girls Club, played played music and they ate food. And yeah, it seemed like a, a cool event. Um, yeah, I wish we could clone uh, Casey Kilgore. She's just outstanding. Yeah. And then... Um, uh, Dale, I don't know if you happen to, you know, Josh has become uh, pretty, uh, pr pretty uh, interested in the, uh, what is it, Strong Towns of Santa Barbara group, which well, now is, well, they're officially, they want to ban cars forever on all eight blocks of State Street. Is it, 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 Do I have that right, Josh? They believe that. Santa Barbara's economy, business, and uh, neighborhood feel would be dramatically improved by not allowing cars in the downtown when they're allowed everywhere else in town. 
You know, Dale, I don't know that I we've ever been on the show when we talked about the state, the closure of State Street, but I would be, let me put a court here and then give me two minutes on, on your view on the, on the closure of State Street. <laughs> It's crazy, you know. I've I've sent uh, I've sent many people a report that a urban planner named Cole Judge did for the city of Fresno, and she looked at every pedestrian mall that has been built in the United States since the 1960s. Eighty-seven percent of them failed, and one of the big indicators. Eighty-seven percent. Eighty-seven percent, and one of the big indicators of failure is they're too big. The ideal size for a pedestrian mall is three blocks. There has never been a successful nine block pedestrian mall in this country ever. But our city council thinks that they can create it. Um, you know, the, and another thing about uh, successful pedestrian malls, they're typically not major traffic arteries. They're usually downtown streets that are not. That are under. Yeah, they're off, they're, you know, they're off to the side. And it's perfectly possible to create something like that, but State Street has none of the conditions uh, that would would indicate success. So to me, I mean, this is another, we've got this long standing crusade in the city to get people out of their cars, which was the phrase that they used when I first got on city council. They stopped saying that, but they're still doing it. That's, that's what they think their mission is. And, you know, the number of cyclists in this city is, relatively large uh, compared to a lot of places in the United States, but it's still like, it's under 2%. Yeah. So and that's not going to change. That's just reality. I guess so. it, I guess it depends how you measure success. So if you measure success by the number of electric bikes exceeding 30 miles an hour at any well, given time. Jerry, you know, that's, that's the other thing. This whole, this was billed as a pedestrian promenade, which it is not. No. It's, it's it's an e-bike freeway, okay? And that's what the transportation department wants, and that's what some of the transportation activists want. You know, that's what Hillary Blackerby wants, but that's that's not what the normal people in Santa Barbara want. No, um, I, I, <laughs> all right, that was funny. <laughs> what, what, what are you laughing about, Josh? Just Dale defining what normal people are, <laughs> but. But I, so I covered the Strong Towns event and it was, a you know, it was a cool event. Sullivan Israel is a local and he put on this event. It was panel discussion and he talked about the importance of making this downtown area a place for different people, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit. He went to Jerusalem and looked at how it works there. David's trying, I mean, a uh, yeah, Dale's trying not to laugh right now. So, um, you know, he showed um, all these slides. They talked about housing. They had another individual talk about the economy. And so it was it was very interesting, you know, but I think it's important that we uh, hear from those uh, strong towns, activists themselves directly. So we get those perspectives. So there's a lot of interest in the story. Uh, we don't know what the State Street Master Plan is going to do, how long it's been. Um, I will say, though, that that, you know, Dale is right. Like the downtown is a bicycle thoroughfare. Um, I was down there this week a couple of times with my daughter and, you know, we, you, the pedestrians, you know, they're on, they're now they're back on the sidewalk. That's where everyone is. There is like a little strip that you can walk next to the bikes, you know, and it is kind of annoying. And I'm not trying to advertise this, but I was doing country line dancing and um, they block it off on State Street on Wednesday nights. And some of the bike people just, bypassed that and like went through all the you know 50 75 whoever people are out there and so that on your instagram are there pictures of you doing that on your i need a few more lessons before it's on my instagram Jerry. But <laughs> i do think even the strong towns people believe that the issue of electric bikes is something that has to be addressed because it's taking away from their larger goal which is to um have it be a, a pedestrian bike area but the electric bikes are are a thing so no i'm not drinking the kool-aid jerry but i'm a reporter i've talked to everybody all right, <laughs> all right we're gonna leave it there callie thank you so much for uh uh battling your illness to, to come in we'll we'll get to the those, those special wildlife crossing signs for the bears uh next <laughs> time because I, I i'm still trying to figure out how the bears know where the wildlife crossings are but 
Um, Dale Francisco, Josh Molina, Cali Fozzi. Thank you so much. Thank you all for watching. And uh, we'll see you next time on Newsmakers. Thanks, Jerry.